Good morning, church. How are we today? Good, good. Hey, it's an amazing day to be in the house of God. I am thrilled to be here with you all. This is my spiritual home. This is the place I walked through the doors and found faith as a 19-year-old kid. I've never lost it since, and I owe all of that to people who were faithful in exactly like Billy said, in just offering an invitation and saying, come. So my invitation to you this morning is exactly what we have heard again and again. The Holy Spirit wants to move in you now. This is not a figure of speech. This is not an idea. This is not something that used to happen in the past. God is present. God is moving. God desires to impact you, to transform you now. Are you, are you believing that this morning, church? Because if you're not, I just got to yell louder and I don't, I'm too old for that. So uh, why don't we pray together? I just want to invite you to extend your hands out with me. And I'm going to pray the oldest prayer in the church. The, the Alpha prayer, the Holy Spirit prayer. It's so simple. It's just this. Holy Spirit, come. Why don't you pray that with me? Holy Spirit, come. Lord, would you impact us this morning? Would you make it not about us, but all about you? Would you help us just have a sense of your presence so strongly? Not so we get the feels, you know, not so we just feel good about ourselves, but Lord, so that we're transformed. We're hungry for your presence. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, um, church, as I was praying, oh yeah, my, my name's Mike, sorry, for those of you who don't know me. Hello, I'm the lead pastor of Encounter Church in Prospect with my wife, Jenny, and it's, it's our joy, but we spent 15 years of our lives here as part of the Journey family, so we love it. This is home. Um, I was praying earlier as, as, as we were all in that posture and listening to the Holy Spirit, and in just listening to the words of that song, God struck me, and God was saying to me, this is a prodigal church. That journey, you are a prodigal church. And what I sense God was saying is that if you're in the room right now, and you have a child, you have a brother, you have a sister, you have a family member who right now is a prodigal to you. They're distant from the Lord and you're, and you're hungry for them. You're actually desperate to see them come to faith. You've been praying for years and years. God is saying, this is the prodigal church. This is the prodigal church for them. Don't be afraid to offer that invitation. It always takes an invitation. And in fact, I'd like, while we listen, it's Pentecost. Let's mess things up. Why don't we reach out now? If that's you, if there is someone in your life, and I'm thinking family members, you don't have to name them. Just stretch out your hand. I'd love to pray for anyone this morning. You've got a family member that you'd call a prodigal. They're distant from God, and you're just desperate for them to come home. Holy Spirit, pour yourself out on every person in this place who has a prodigal family member. The brothers, the sisters, the sons and daughters. God, you are faithful. You love them more than we do. You desire them to come home more than we do. Would you give us boldness in our spirits for the people in this room that we could be witnesses to them? We're not just talking about it. We're doing it. We're doing the work of an evangelist. And Holy Spirit, you're going to minister to those people, each and every one of them. You are faithful courage to invite, belief to start conversations, and gentleness, winsomeness, courage, that we would see the work of God happening in our family members, in our lifetimes, in this day. We pray that in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Man, so good. How good is Pentecost Sunday? Look, we've been listening to Acts 2 a bit. I feel like we should read it. Is that good? Because the word of God is better than anything I'm going to bring you. So why don't we read that together? Acts chapter 2. It's a good chapter. It's very Pentecosty. It's a word. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone say, then. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem. I love that bit. <laughs> like, oh, there were Jews in Jerusalem, you say. Yeah, okay, yes, that was happening in Israel. You're fine. Devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit comes, a crowd comes. And was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native tongue? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia, 
Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. You know, I was at the Generate conference on the weekend, which was fantastic, and shouts to Steph Ty, who did an amazing job facilitating it. Just an, an incredible time. There's a new Zimbabwean faith community in, in Generate Presbytery, and it's so exciting. And one of the things that the pastor shared, he said, one of the joys is that we can now hear the wonders of God in our own tongue. That's a Pentecost moment for us all. Two more verses. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but I've noticed that my needs drive my desires, right? Like I like to think I'm a pretty stable human being. Actually, no, I don't. I know myself. I'm not stable in the slightest. But I like the idea that I might be a stable human being, conceptually, not in reality. But we did something recently as an eldership and group of pastors of the church. We did a 48-hour water-only fast, which is the thing elders and pastors do if they feel like they're being particularly holy or not holy enough. I'll let you decide. And we went about this 48-hour fast, and we went, listen, it's only two days, right? How bad can it be? Kids do the 40-hour famine. Toughen up. We can do this. 24 hours. No worries. You're a bit hungry, but that's all right. Jesus was hungry in the desert. We were surviving. Second day... Second day was a little bit different. Seasoned elders are sending messages on Slack going, pray for me, I'm struggling. People are having like little breakdowns going, I'm just, I had to leave work early today because my body was breaking down. I'm very holy and I just went and had a nap because as a pastor, everything I do is spiritual. So I, I had a nap and, and, and sort of prayed in the spirit in my Z's, because it was more of a passing out than a nap. I just stopped. My body stopped working. And we got these instructions that said, listen, even if it's only two days, just end off with like a vegetable broth. And we went, well, that sounds disgusting. No, steak. And guess what we ate? <laughs> vegetable broth. Because we were weak as kittens. You know that old Snickers ad that was like, you're not you when you're hungry? I actually find that we are more ourselves than when we are hungry. When we are hungry, we're like, oh, that's how I'm really going emotionally. That's how, where my physical fitness level is actually at, as if I wasn't painfully aware of that already. That's where my spiritual life really is. That's where my mental health really is. We are actually, when our needs are really cut down to it, that's when we are most ourselves because we've got nowhere else to go. We've got nothing else to look at. You know that classic thing to do when people say, hey, don't think about the color red, and all you can think about is the color red. It's like that. That's what fasting does to our spirits. It brings us back to ourselves. And what we've seen over this last season is that when you bring COVID and when you remove security and comfort and understanding and, and all of our surroundings, we get confused and upset and begin to seek spiritual clarity. That's what every Google statistic is telling us about searches during the time of COVID. That is what happens. And this is the context of Pentecost. Jesus has departed. He's ascended. It's been amazing. He's going, go back to Jerusalem. And as he departs, the disciples get mostly confusion, mostly a bit of lack of clarity about what's going on in their lives, but they faithfully go back and wait for the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what you might not know about Pentecost. Pentecost is a Greek word. It comes from the word pente, which means five in Greek. And it's 50 days after the Passover. Now, if you're familiar with the Passover, if you've been in church for a while, you would have heard about the Passover. The Passover is the celebration, the Jewish festival that celebrates the passing over of the angel of death on the Israelites as they escape from Egypt. So it's an act of salvation, both from death, but also from the exodus, that they were taken out of slavery into new life and into the desert. But, you know, Israelites can Israelites. But what you might not know is that Pentecost, which was known as the Festival of Weeks, the Jewish Festival of Weeks, is, at Passover, that's when they would start to bring in the grain because it was an agricultural culture. So they'd bring in the grain and the farmers would start to bring it in and, you know, it's a good time. And they'd get through about 50 days and they would celebrate the end of that season at the Festival of Weeks, at Pentecost. Here's what I'm saying, church. Passover is about salvation. Pentecost is about the harvest. Pentecost is when the harvest comes in. Passover is when salvation came. Passover is the death and resurrection of Jesus. But Pentecost is when the harvest became apparent. That's when that started to open up as the church was born. So 
Let's get into the text a little bit here. Because in some ways, this is the best passage in the Bible. And in others, it is the worst, because you've all heard it. If you've been in church long enough to have a cup of coffee, you have heard Acts 2, which means that as I read it, you can sort of tune out. And if you are tuning out during Pentecost, we have a problem. Because the purpose of the Word of God is not to be listened to. It is to convict you. The Word of God pierces bone and marrow. The Word of God comes between soul and spirit and hits you. That is what is meant to happen when you open up the Holy Scriptures and allow God to speak to you through it. And so if Pentecost has become blasé to you, then today is the day to let it no longer become blasé. Amen? Today is the day to let it set you on fire again. I am hearing this word a lot. Katie touched on it earlier. Not loins, not that word. I've already heard that twice too many this morning. The word revival. The word revival. It's a word people say they're hungry for, that they're praying for, that they're longing for. There is a hunger in the church in Australia for revival. Anybody else feeling that? I I really hope so. I say amen to that. I'm so excited for a revival. And we should want to see revival, but what I want to suggest to you is that revival is not random. Revival is not something that God just drops by accident and people go, oh, that's pretty good. We're having a good moment here. No, no, you and I can cultivate space for revival. That's what I want to talk about this morning. And let me borrow from Mark Sayers here, who says this, personal renewal precedes corporate revival. If you're playing Mike Bingo at home, that's the first Mark Sayers quote. You're fine. Well done. You will not see revival as a community unless you seek personal renewal in your own hearts. Let me say that again. You won't see it. You will not see the power of God come in your time unless you seek personal renewal in your own heart. When I say you need personal renewal, this is what I mean. I would define personal renewal as realignment with God's presence and repartnering with God's purpose. Realign with God's presence, repartner with God's purpose. Now, that's too hard. I understand. We need alliteration. Openness, obedience. We got that? Openness to what God wants to do, obedience to actually do it. That's what it means to seek personal renewal. And when we look at the word revival, do you know what that is? It's just renewal gone viral. That's what revival is. It's when renewal breaks out in enough people's hearts and it starts to go viral and entire cities are swept up in it. Go talk to the the citizens of Wales about what happened there when the revival swept through Wales, the Azusa Street revival. There are revival histories throughout our globe and in Australia and we are primed and ready for another one. COVID has actually broken down Our sense of understanding is if we have it all together. If we were ever confused about that, we know now we don't. We were barely hanging on. I'm sure none of you rushed out to buy toilet paper on that day. We recognize that we need something. We need Pentecost. And we sometimes forget that the church was birthed not out of people doing a strategic plan, not even out of people reading the scriptures, but out of a prayer meeting. The disciples gathered in an upper room faithfully praying. And that is a requirement if we're going to see revival. This is what it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 to 15. When my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. My eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to prayer from this place. You hear that? We actually need to be paying attention to what God's doing. We must be doing it. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Mike, are you saying we can force revival? No, I am not. God does what God wants. God's times and purposes are his own. We cannot force his hand. What we can do is cultivate space for revival to take root in our own hearts. This is my passionate belief as a Pentecostal, meaning somebody who lives in a church birthed out of Pentecost, that's all of you, by the way, that God is wanting to do revival all the time. Because he loves you and he loves me and he loves all of your friends and family more than we do. That's what he wants to do. What I'm saying is that it's a cop out when we simply say revival is God's job. Oh, I'm waiting for revival. It'll come in God's timing. I'll just go over here. I'm going out of the pub, you know, and I get that. Pub meals are great, but that's a cop out. Church, that's a cop out. We cannot just say, God will do it in God's timing. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to prepare our own hearts, our own minds, our own spirits to allow God to do a move within us 
That is, when revival comes, will we be ready for it? Because if we're not, different things will happen. We can't outsource personal renewal, right? Here's why that's true. When I say openness and obedience, I'm talking about you guys having passion and personal responsibility, right? So passion is having a roaring fire. Personal responsibility is going to get some logs to feed it. Passion is having your hands raised in worship. Come on, Jesus, you do your work. Personal responsibility is then going home and reading your Bible daily when no one is watching you. Passion in church and listen and learn. Personal responsibility is being convicted, going home and calling a counsellor to say, actually, I need some stuff worked out and I need to talk through it with somebody. Passion and personal responsibility need to go together. Let me give you a visual example. We have a church full of young adults who I love. I have to say that as a disclaimer. One of them was over recently, and my wife was about to throw out a bunch of batteries. She was just going to throw them in the garbage because we were raised in the 80s. And if it doesn't have a nuclear logo on it, as far as I'm concerned, it is allowed to go in the garbage. Teach me. Don't fight me. Teach me. And so our young adult got very upset. She's like, no, 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 no. Batteries have to be recycled separately. And Jen was like, all right. Do, go, go and do it. Grab them. Go and do it. She's like, all right. And she gathered all the batteries together, and she put them in this single-use cup, two single-use cups, in fact, and then she just left them on our piano. <laughs> you see the difference between passion and personal responsibility? <laughs> Found them yesterday morning. <laughs> you cannot have personal renewal with only one of those. Passion without personal responsibility is shallow. If you're very passionate, but you don't do anything to develop your faith, you're shallow. But if you're a very responsible person, but you don't cultivate passion within you, you're joyless, like dry bones. But passion and personal responsibility together is how we see renewal. Openness to the presence, obedience to the promptings. It's not about your age and stage of life. It's not about where you're starting. It's about where God's calling you into. Because we can stop revival if we want. Did you know that? 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says this, Do not quench the Spirit. Now, am I saying we can stop what God wants to do? No, no, no. But you can stop what He wants to do in you. You can quench the Spirit in your own life. This is what the Amplified Version says. Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the working and guidance of the Holy Spirit. I like the Passion Translation, which is probably the only time you hear me say that sentence. Never restrain or put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Never restrain or put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. You and I can quench the Spirit's fire. We can. So I want to quickly share a few things that will quench the Spirit's fire in your life. AM service, this is tailored for you. I've got different things for the PM service. Because if you want corporate revival, you need personal renewal. But for those of us in this room, the age demographic tends to trend slightly higher than it does for those in the PM service. That's fine. So what I want to talk about is leaving a legacy of revival. A legacy of revival. Here's five things we can do to quench that legacy that we've got to avoid. Number one, complacency. Complacency. Here's what I notice about 39-year-old white male Christians in my home. (laughs) They can get easily complacent with their spiritual lives. They can get spiritually fat and lazy. Occasionally physically fat and lazy. (laughs) We get very blasé with the creator that Hebrews 12.29 describes as a consuming fire. I have never been blasé immediately in the presence of a consuming fire. I am stepping back in careful awe. There is an appropriate fear we have around the presence of God. But when we get complacent, when we get blasé, when we have been doing this for a really long time, we go into autopilot, don't we? We know we do. And that's okay. God is gracious. He is faithful. But we've got to do something to short circuit us, to snap us back out of it. Because church, Jesus is your friend, but he isn't your equal. He is your friend, but he is not your equal. If you cannot remember your first love, if you cannot recover your passion, you will become spiritually fat and lazy. More than that, true friendship requires investment. You can't treat the Lord like one half of an old married couple. For that matter, don't treat your spouse like one half of an old married couple. Treat them with reverence and respect and love. Here's what you need to do to combat this complacency. Remember the joy of your salvation. 
If you go back to that moment and you can remember that joy, you take yourself back to what the Lord did in you that first time. You will not become complacent. You will remember how precious it was. That moment where God called you home, meditate on that. Seriously. Spend some time just sitting in that, meditating on that. And then communicate it to your family and friends around you. That's the first one. So that's complacency. The second one's disunity. In Acts 2, 8, the crowd is astonished that despite their ethnic diversity, the Holy Spirit is drawing them in and connecting them together. Now, Pentecost, friends, I don't know if you know this, it's the reverse of the Tower of Babel. In the Tower of Babel, cocky humans want to be like God and strive to get there, and God divides their languages. At Pentecost, humble humans wait on the presence of God, and God unites their languages. He brings them back together. He heals the division of Pentecost through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Diversity doesn't quench the Holy Spirit. That's Christ's vision for his church. Let's be clear on that. Disunity quenches the Spirit. Disunity is how most revivals end. When we all become the little gods of our own lives, we all slowly get our preferences and sort of drift away. Disunity is like cordial at a camp in the 90s. Yeah, that hit home for some people, didn't it? You know how far two litres of cordial can go in a 60,000-gallon water tank. As long as it has a tinge of orange, it's orange-flavoured cordial. That's what disunity is like in the church. It dilutes the work of the Holy Spirit. It dilutes the focus of God in your life and across the breadth of the church. You've got to combat that as well. Now, here's how you can do it. If you want to see a legacy of revival, break out a journey, and you should, friends, because if you don't, you're spiritually dead. Just let that one sit there. Support your leaders, invest in the vision, pray together. Chris Haynes, did you just cut my mic off after I said that? Are you spiritually dead? I'm praying for you, Chris. We're both in our 30s now. (laughs) It's going to be a great six months. (laughs) Disunity is the end product of our own desires, overcoming the desires of God. So we've got to avoid that, avoid that dilution. Here's number three. Ready for this one? Cynicism. Cynicism quenches the spirit. Verse 13. Some sneered and said they're drunk on new wine. Why do you think they did that? Because it's easier to tear down than build up. Way easier. Australians are expert cynics. We love to tear down anyone who's successful. We distrust institutions. We disbelieve anything we can't see with our own two eyes. Sometimes we disbelieve what we can see with our own two eyes. At Pentecost, there was a visible miracle. And in the midst of this visible miracle where people randomly come in and they say, not the disciples, the crowd says, they're speaking my language. How is this possible? Other people in the crowd go, guess they're just drunk. I've never known that to happen. I've been in many, many pubs. Too many, perhaps. I have never seen a whole bunch of people talking like that and other people gathering going, they're speaking my language all of a sudden. No, 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 unless they are also drunk, in which case... There seems to be some special language they speak together. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the attitude and the posture of people that just come and say, I don't believe what is happening. Why? Because I don't want to. Because I have a posture of cynicism. I'm distrusting. Cynicism will break your church. It'll harden your heart. It'll crush your soul. It'll limit your vision. It limits what you are able to believe. You've got to fight cynicism in your life. God isn't restricted by your cynicism, but he's not going to bless it either. If you're here, hands out, going, God, I want your blessing, and you're being cynical about everything that's happening, you're reading those lyrics going, oh, I've seen cancer just be like, oh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. God's pretty good, but it's like, Christians, wake up. God can do anything. And that's what we need to have. We need to have that posture that anything can happen. If you want to see a legacy of revival, don't let cynicism rule in your hearts. Instead, Trust in the promises of God. All right, I'm starting to slow down here, I promise. Number four, fear. Fear is very simple, but it's the one that grips us the hardest. It's a symptom of our need for control. We fear what we can't control or don't understand, and revival is both those things. But there's one specific kind of fear I want to speak into. I see many, many Christian parents at the moment who are genuinely afraid to disciple their own children. Now, either it's because we feel like we don't know enough, I am deeply sympathetic to that position, or because we don't want to tell them who to be, because culturally we're not allowed to do that anymore, 
or to push them away from church. We're afraid that if we push too hard, we might push them away. Can I tell you, if you're a parent in this room and if you don't disciple your children, YouTube and Tinder and TikTok will, and they won't ask your permission, they'll just do it. So it's really up to you. What do you want to do? How do you want to disciple? Your children are being formed. The question is by who? We need to be intentional. Now, I'm not a perfect parent. Not 12 hours ago, my middle child ate dust and I made him. I'm fine with it. It's a heck of a story by story. I mean, Instagram story. Have a look. Not there. But we know some good pediatricians, so we figure it'll be fine. (laughs) But if you want to leave a legacy of revival, church, seriously, for a moment, if you want to leave a legacy of revival you gotta, you got to care a little bit less about the control and the fear over how your kids will start to break out in their faith. You know, you gotta, you got to have more Andy talks all the time, or he used to. He probably still does. He's getting older. He'll repeat himself. He, he used to talk all the time about the kid in the sleeping bag in the prayer meeting. You know, and we listened to that, and we took that seriously. And so when we have prayer meetings, that's what we do. Our kids come along, and they just sort of hang out in the back, and it's a weeknight. <gasps> oh, What happens if at health hustle tomorrow, your eight-year-old isn't fully engaged? I'll let you answer that question for yourself. I'll tell you what happens. My daughter, 12 years old, is a warrior in prayer because she used to just sit quietly in the room while we were praying. She'd just watch. She wouldn't say anything. She'd just watch. And then she saw that we were opening up. I wasn't reading from them. So she began to read from them. She had passages highlighted for her. And so she opened them up and began to speak them out prophetically. And at first we're like, oh, that's really, that's sweet, darling. We're being really patronizing. And then we started to listen. We're like, that's spot on. That's prophetic. That actually, you're you're 10 years old right now and you are speaking prophetic wisdom that I need. And so we would name that and call it out of her and say, Grace, that, that was prophetic for me right now. You've got a gift. And so we're beginning the cycle of breaking this fear of what, I don't know, being tired for school one day is going to be. It's fine. There is a lot of time for that. Bring your children into the space where they're going to be surrounded by prayer and worship. It's this space. And please, as a former youth pastor, if they've ever come back from a camp and they're on this spiritual high and they're like, Mom, Dad, I, I think God's calling me to be a pastor or a missionary. Well, God help them, a Christian educator. (laughs) Love you, Craig. If they come home full of the Holy Spirit and say that, don't quench them out of of your fear about them not being a doctor or lawyer, out of your fear about them not having income down the track because the world needs skilled, successful, healthy, competent, confident, fired up pastors and leaders as much as it needs teachers and and educators and lawyers and hospital workers. We need all these people, followers of Jesus on mission in all these places. Don't quench the Spirit's work in your children. Encourage them. Get alongside them. Maybe they won't. Maybe it is just the high of a youth camp. What have you got to lose by encouraging them instead of discouraging them? Is that what we want? Here's the last one. Unrepentant hearts. The key to all of this is seen in the last few verses of the chapter. Peter finishes his message. The band comes back up, I assume. And the crowd is cut to the heart. And when they're cut to the heart, they have the courage to do this. They say, what should I do? So many of us, we get cut to the heart and we're like, Oh, it'd be embarrassing to ask questions. I'll just slide out the back door. No, 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 no. What should we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Friends, the biggest thing that will quench the Holy Spirit in your lives is unrepentant sin in your heart. It's unresolved sin. What's that really? It's lack of personal responsibility for your spiritual life. It's lack of character. It's lack of accountability. It's lack of support. There's nothing more important in our lives than following Jesus. And nothing will get in the way like an unrepentant heart. We must be regularly confessing our sins to each other. The results are catastrophic if we don't. So what are you doing to cultivate renewal? What are you doing to leave a spiritual legacy? Here's what I'll finish with. 
If you're here right now, this has felt a bit heavy. Like even, even as I'm writing, I'm like, ah, oh God, five points on what not to do. Like that's you're gonna be spin it positively. That's called conviction. That that heaviness, that sense of, oh man, this this hits. That's conviction. We should all be feeling this. Because one way or the other, we are probably doing something that's blocking the work of the Spirit in our lives. Unintentionally, I hope. So we should all be looking for ways to cultivate it. But if you're here and you're feeling heavy and you're feeling convicted and you don't know what to do, I've got good news for you. This isn't how the story ends. Acts chapter 2, verses 38b to 39. After the people are cut to the heart, they repent of their sin. Peter tells them this, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Maybe you feel far off today. You feel estranged from God. You feel like you've either never known Him or it's been so long or you put up walls between you and God. Your Bible's getting dusty on a shelf. Your spirit's getting dusty inside you. Maybe you feel far off. God says the promise of the Holy Spirit being poured out on you is for you. It is for you. It is the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise. The promise. I want you to hear that. There is no better day than Pentecost to rebuild your life on the promises of God. On the day of Pentecost, oh, I love this. 3,000 people come to saving faith in Jesus. 3,000. Now, we talk about that. We get excited about that. But I don't want you to get excited about that right now. You go be excited about that later. Here's what I want you to get excited about. Acts 2.42. In the days that followed, every day, every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. We do not live on the day of Pentecost. We're celebrating it. We live out of the overflow of Pentecost. But every day, every day, God across this globe is adding to our number as followers of Jesus. Every day, every day, there are people in your lives waking up with unresolved questions. Every day. Every day there are people hungry for the Spirit of God. They don't know what they even need. They're desperate every day. Church, you are the missionaries of God to these people. You are the Holy Spirit coming to these people, ministering to them, praying for them, getting alongside them, inviting them, encouraging them. These people exist in your life if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, if we can stop repressing the work and quenching the work of the Spirit in our lives. Why don't we stand together as we worship and finish? Church, you've got two choices here. I'm going to invite you to reach out your hands and receive the Holy Spirit in a moment. You can say yes or no. I don't mind. What I'm really asking is, do you want to treat this like any other Sunday? Or do you want to genuinely ask the presence of God to impact you right now? Do you want to treat this like, yeah, we get up, this is the thing we do on Sunday? You can if you want to. That's up to you. But if you need the power of God in your life, if you know that God is real, or you're so desperate you're not willing to try for the first time, maybe this is what you need right now. Come on, if that's you, why don't you just stretch out your hands and receive the Holy Spirit? Stretch them right out. God is longing to fill you in this place. God is faithful to you in this place. In the midst of your brokenness and struggles, God is crying out love for you. God wants to call you home. He calls you His daughter. He calls you His son. Lord Jesus, right now we invite your presence in this place. You are always present. You're omnipresent. But Lord, we long for your manifest presence. The tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. God, pour yourself out. Pour yourself out. Lord, would you break and convict our hearts in Jesus' name. Would you break and convict our hearts, God? Father, for everyone right now, they're stretching out their hands. Would you fill them with your Spirit? Would they hear the whisper of the Spirit for them right now? For them right now. It's got an image in my mind. There's a, there's a, there's a winding path in a wood and there's a young man. You're looking around. You're very agitated and anxious. It's like you're lost. God's saying, it's okay, just stay to the path. I know it's winding, but it's taking you home. Okay, I just believe that's a word for someone in this place this morning. There's another picture in my mind. There's, a, there's an older lady here. 
I'll say older like me, <laughs> older, 40 and above, uh, you're, you're on your knees, you're crying, you're weeping, like, that, that, that those crying when we've got nothing left to give, those sort of tears. God is saying, I'm near to the brokenhearted. I am near to you in your tears. If that's you, God is near to you in your tears. If there's somebody else you hear, you need healing, you've, you've got pain in your mouth, in your upper left area of your mouth. I don't know what kind of ministry you need. I don't know what kind of healing that is, what kind of problem it is. God is here to heal that right now. If that's you, just receive the Holy Spirit. Cry out to God for healing. Come on, church, why don't we just cry out to God right now? You don't need Lucky leading you in song to do it. The Holy Spirit is here now. Cry out to the Holy Spirit. What's on your heart? Who do you need to pray for? I know Jesus isn't your equal, but he is your friend. You can cry out to him as a friend. And speak to him as a friend. He loves you. He's here for you. Holy Spirit, come. Come right now. God, we invite the prodigal home. You set the captives free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For those online, Lord, we pray for them right now. That as they stretch out their hands, you'd be receiving the Holy Spirit. If you're in Malala, we're praying for you right now. Stretch out your hands. Receive the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus.